Hello fleet and welcome back to episode 32 in the Know Your Ship series. Today's episode is going to cover the Baltimore class heavy cruisers, which will appear as the tier 9 US cruiser in World of Warships. Now before I get to the actual episode, just a few pieces of news first. I have Epic Battles episode 3 made and uploaded, but it appears that there is a hard limit on how many videos could have been approved and released, so for now, that video is on hold. But I do promise that the moment I do get approval, I will release it to all of you. Also, this is going to sound a little bit silly, but 6 months after starting to record stuff and make videos, I actually finally figured out how to use this microphone correctly. So I had originally put the mic a little bit too far from me, hence why most of you always heard that echo. So back to this episode. The Baltimore class heavy cruisers were designed without the limitations of the naval treaties, hence their significant increase in tonnage. They displaced 14,733 tons standard and 17,273 tons fully loaded. These ships were 673 feet 5 inches or 205.26 meters in length. They were equipped with steam turbines that pushed out 120,000 shaft horsepower to four screws that gave the Baltimore class heavy cruisers a very respectable 33 knot top speed. Range was also plentiful as these ships could cruise for about 10,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. The Baltimores were also well armored, having a 6 inch armor belt and a 3 inch armored deck. Armament was equally impressive with 9 8 inch 55 caliber guns. The Baltimore herself got the older Mark 12 guns, while subsequent ships in the class were given the newer Mark 15s. 12 5 inch 38s and numerous numbers of 20mm and 40mm anti aircraft guns. The Baltimore, unlike its Japanese counterparts, did not carry torpedoes, as anti aircraft protection was deemed to be significantly more important than torpedoes. Four scout planes were also carried, two of them on the catapults at the stern of the ship and two in the hangar below. Only eight Baltimore class ships actually saw service during World War II, seven of them in the Pacific Theater and one in the Atlantic. The Baltimores would have an interesting post-World War II life, taking part in the Korean conflict, being modified into the first guided missile cruisers, and also taking part in the Vietnam War. None of the Baltimore-class ships have survived to this day. Alright folks, time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the short episode on the Baltimore-class heavy cruisers. Baltimore is the lead ship of her class. Born in the steelworks of Massachusetts in 1942, she's 673 feet of Yankee iron. She is armed with nine eight-inch guns, five-inch 38s, and an arsenal of automatic weapons. Now, she's breaking them in at Macon Atoll. Baltimore's Mark 12 eight-inch turrets are a complex system of hoists that bring the heavy ordnance from the magazine and handling rooms to the breach of the guns. The Mark 12 8 inch 55 caliber gun can launch a shell more than 30,000 yards. Baltimore is within deadly killing range of Macon, and Butari Tari is a target rich environment. She will fire more than 1,300 rounds at the enemy island on this single day. I'm going to quickly cut in here and point out an inaccuracy in that Battle 360 clip. The model they used to represent the Baltimore class is inaccurate. The real Baltimore class ships had a resemblance to the Cleveland class light cruisers in terms of how the secondary armament was laid out. If you look at this picture, you'll notice that behind the number 2 and number 3 gun turrets is actually a dual 5 inch 38, something that did not appear in the model in Battle 360. I suspect they got a bit lazy and used an Iowa model as a substitute. Just to show you the gun layout a little bit more clearly, here are the Baltimore's two forward 8-inch guns, as well as the dual 5-inch 38 that lies behind turret number 2. The USS Baltimore herself actually missed the Leyte Gulf campaign in 1944 because she was tasked with carrying President Roosevelt and his party to Pearl Harbor to meet with Admiral Nimitz and Douglas MacArthur. Here she is, pulling into Pearl and dropping off the President. By the time she made it back to the war zone, the Baltimore had missed the Battle of Leyte Gulf. She was, however, present at earlier campaigns at Truk, Marcus Island, Wake Island, Saipan, and the Battle of the Philippine Sea. 
The Baltimore sister ships all had their own interesting stories. Take the USS Canberra, for example. She is the only United States Navy warship to have ever been named after a foreign warship and a foreign capital city. She was named Canberra in honor of the loss of the HMAS Canberra at the Battle of Savo Island. The Canberra engaged in a number of various actions in the Pacific, including at Iwatek, the Western New Guinea Islands, Truk, Marcus and Wake Islands, the Marianas, the Philippines, and a number of other locations. The Canberra was the only Baltimore-class cruiser to have suffered damage through enemy fire during World War II. On October the 13th of 1944, she was hit by an airdrop Japanese torpedo and suffered damage and the loss of 23 personnel. By the time she was repaired in October of 1945, the war was nearly over, and she spent her remaining time of the Second World War on the west coast of the United States. Another ship of the class, with an interesting, albeit short career, was the USS Quincy. She was named after the USS Quincy of the New Orleans class that was also sunk at the Battle of Savo Island. The Quincy was the only Baltimore-class ship that served in the Atlantic Theater. On the 6th of June, 1944, the Quincy bombarded targets at Utah Beach in support of the D-Day landings. From June the 6th to the 17th, she neutralized enemy shore batteries, tanks, and other enemy targets. On the 24th of June, as part of Task Force 129, she bombarded targets in Sherbrooke, France. In August of 1944, the Quincy, along with British and French cruisers, paved the way for the Allied landings on the south coast of France. Finally, on September the 1st of 1944, she was detached from her European duties and returned back to Boston. A really interesting event would occur on February the 14th of 1945. President Roosevelt met with then Saudi King Abdul Aziz ibn Saud aboard the USS Quincy and negotiated a secret agreement whereby the United States will provide Saudi Arabia with military assistance, training, and a military base in exchange for secure access to supplies of oil. In honor of this meeting, the official residence of the American ambassador to Saudi Arabia is named Quincy House. After this event, the Quincy joined up with various task forces in the Pacific and took part in actions against Okinawa and the Japanese home islands. She entered Tokyo Bay on the 1st of September 1945 to end World War II. Construction of the ship began in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1943 at the height of World War II. Commissioned for military service in 1945, she then steamed through the Panama Canal to the Pacific Ocean, where she would serve for the rest of her lifetime. At 674 feet long and 13,600 tons, she was in the class of U.S. warships called heavy cruisers. Not as protected by armor as a battleship, but with many big guns, she could fire 260-pound shells at targets 15 miles away. The USS St. Paul was in Tokyo Bay as the Japanese surrendered on September 2, 1945. She also had the distinction of firing the last shots on Japan in the Second World War and the last shots in the Korean War. The most serious casualties ever suffered aboard the vessel came not from enemy guns, but from an accident. On April 21, 1952, an explosion and powder fire broke out in the forward 8-inch gun turret. Thirty men were lost. The USS St. Paul served as flagship to squadrons of smaller cruisers during many operations. The flagship is the vessel carrying the commanding admiral. Many other dignitaries and heads of state embarked on the St. Paul, including President Eisenhower. In 1964, John Wayne, Kirk Douglas, and others filmed scenes for the World War II epic In Harm's Way aboard the ship. When she was decommissioned in 1971, she had fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. She had fired more rounds of ammunition than any other U.S. cruiser in history and earned 18 battle stars. 
That same year, St. Paul Mayor Charles McCarty accepted the bell as a historic memento to be put on display. The bell was given by the Navy with the understanding that should the ship be recommissioned, the bell would be returned to her. Each mayor of St. Paul is required to submit to the Navy's loan officer an annual report on the condition of the bell. Finally, in 1980, nine years after she docked for the last time, the USS St. Paul was sold for scrap. Although technically still on indefinite loan, it appears that the Bell's namesake city will be its home from now on. I actually managed to find a few clips of the USS St. Paul firing her main guns, so enjoy. Anyhow, back to the USS Baltimore for a bit, North Korea actually claims that one of their torpedo boats sank the USS Baltimore during the Korean War, even though the USS Baltimore was held in decommissioned reserve from 1946 until 1951. And even when she was recommissioned, she was assigned to the Atlantic Fleet. Some ships of the Baltimore class were converted to become guided missile cruisers. The Boston, Canberra, Columbus, and Chicago were all given missiles. The Boston and Canberra in particular would be the first two guided missile cruisers in the United States Navy, designated CAG-1 and CAG-2. A glimpse of the Navy of tomorrow, the USS Boston, America's first guided missile cruiser in action off Cuba. From below deck magazines, its potent Terrier missiles are automatically positioned on launching racks. Ship and missile were designed for each other in what engineers call an integrated weapon system, lethally efficient. This cruiser mounts no big guns. One of its missiles can sink any enemy ship, or with an atom warhead, smash an enemy base. A full salvo can be aimed and fired in seconds, guided to target while in flight. And that's all, folks, for this episode on the Baltimore-class heavy cruisers. I'm still trying to slow myself down, but it is pretty tough. Hopefully, I'll get better at this over time. I'll continue to make more of these Know Your Ship episodes while we wait for authorization to release another batch of in-game videos. Aside from all that, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hopefully, you'll have a fantastic day, and I'll see you all on the high seas soon.